Have a good day. Have a happy school day. We are so happy you could join us as we honor Ashley Bryan, 13 time Coretta Scott King Award recipient, more than any other author illustrator to date. 12 CSK Book Awards, including double honors for Lion and the Ostrich Chicks and Freedom Over Me. And Virginia Hamilton Lifetime Achievement Award recipient. His CSK honors are just the tip of the iceberg as Ashley Bryan's footprint on stories, poetry, books, and art is worldwide and like no other. Let the tribute begin. Ashley Bryan was born in New York City on July 13, 1923, the second of six children. From a young age, Bryan showed an affinity for art. I was always drawing and painting. I can't remember a time when I've not been drawing and painting. In kindergarten, Ashley's teacher instructed students in bookmaking, further encouraging the child's love of art. The greatest reward was when I brought my little ABC book home from kindergarten. And my mother hugged me. My dad spun me around. My friends and family all clapped. Hooray, Ashley, hooray, Ashley. Kindergarten, he published a book. It was on that recognition and on that support that I built. Upon graduating high school, Brian sent his portfolio to a leading art institute, where a judge proclaimed it was one of the best he had seen, but it would be a waste to give a scholarship to a Black student. Ashley then sent his materials to the Cooper Union. They do not see you there, Brian's teachers told him, just the finished artwork itself. His superb portfolio garnered him a spot at the prestigious institution. Brian's schooling was interrupted by World War II when he was drafted into the Army. However, this didn't interrupt Brian's artistic endeavors. And even when I was in the Second World War and we were on Normandy, when I got into the amphibious duck, first thing I did was take out my sketch pad and draw the other soldiers coming after me. And his love of art was such that he kept a sketch pad and art supplies in his gas mask. Brian eventually returned home to the U.S., where he re-enrolled in the Cooper Union to finish his schooling. In the summer of 1946, Brian was granted a scholarship to study at the Skowhegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine. On weekend visits to Acadia National Park, Ashley would look out and see the Cranberry Islands off the coast, one of which, Little Cranberry Island, he would eventually call home. In the 1950s, Brian spent time teaching art and, of course, creating art. He received a Fulbright scholarship, which allowed Ashley to study at the University of Freiburg im Breisgau. After a few years in Germany, Brian returned home and picked up where he had left off, teaching art and painting. His artwork caught the eye of Jean Carl, an editor at Athenaeum Publishers, who signed Brian to his first book contract, a collection of poems by Rabindranath Tagore entitled, Moon, For What Do You Wait? Ashley and Jean Carl would work together on dozens of books before her death in 2000. Ashley Bryan won his first Coretta Scott King medal in 1981, an illustrator award for Beat the Story Drum, Pum Pum. Among his other CSK recognized work are Beautiful Blackbird, Let It Shine, Freedom Over Me, and Infinite Hope, which follows Brian during World War II and was his final CSK honor in 2020. You don't act like me. 
You don't eat like me. You don't get down in the groove and move your feet like me. Black is beautiful, aha! Uh -huh. Black is beautiful, aha! Uh -huh. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. The Ashley Bryan Center was created in 2013 by Nichols B. Clark in close collaboration with Ashley to preserve, celebrate, and share broadly his work, joy of discovery, invention, learning, and community. While not a bricks and mortar institution, the center promotes opportunities for people to create and appreciate visual art, literature, music, and the oral and written traditions of poetry. The center is fiercely committed to fostering cultural understanding and personal pride through scholarship, exhibitions, and opportunities in the arts. In 2019, all works on paper, plus items from each medium in which Ashley has worked, was gifted to the Kislak Center for Special Collections at the University of Pennsylvania. Currently, the center is working with colleges and museums to place more of Ashley's art, puppets, and linoleum prints in Maine to create an art trail, thus ensuring his Maine legacy. The sea glass panels will remain on Islesford at the Congregational Church and in the pavilion. Mr. Bryant was the recipient of two Lifetime Achievement Awards. He received the Virginia Hamilton Lifetime Achievement Award in 2012. Dr. Pauletta Brown Bracey, chair of the committee noted that Ashley Bryan, author, folklorist, poet, and illustrator, couples a melodic voice to his brilliant artwork, transcending literary and artistic genre that leave readers unimaginably satisfied. In 2009, he received the Laura Ingalls Wilder Award, now the Legacy Award. Chair Catherine Mercier noted that Ashley Bryan has filled children's literature with the beats of story, the echoes of poetry, the transcendence of African-American spirituals, the beauty of art, and the satisfaction of a tale well told. Generations of readers have seen themselves in the pages of Bryan's books. He has inspired today's children's book writers and illustrators to tell, paint, sing, and weave their own stories for generations to come. We remember Ashley Bryan for his ever hopeful and optimistic outlook reflected in each of his over 70 books. Here is what he said when he accepted the Boston Globe Hornbook Nonfiction Award in January 2021. By selecting Infinite Hope as an outstanding nonfiction book, the Boston Globe Hornbook Awards Committee is encouraging the public not only to read it because of its importance, but to have hope for our future. It is through this hope that we strive for change and work at accomplishing it. In 2021, his alma mater, Cooper Union, honored him with the Augustus St. Gaudens Award for Professional Achievement in Art. Ashley's work has a global footprint and is recognized throughout the world. In 2013, the International Board on Books selected Ashley Bryan's poster, featuring Pat Mora's poem, Book Joy, Around the World to celebrate International Children's Book Day. Pat shared this remembrance. What an honor to have Ashley Bryan illustrate my words. He was a gifted giant in children's books. Ashley was always generous. I carry his smile. Friends and family have joined us now to share a few stories. My name is Rich Entel, and I've been a friend of Ashley ever since I took a course with him in college at Dartmouth back in 1978, I believe. He was a remarkable, passionate professor 
And uh, one of the things I remember most is his references to a quote from Hokusai. From the age of six, I had a mania for drawing the shapes of things. When I was 50, I had published a universe of designs. But all I have done before the age of 70 is not worth bothering with. At 75, I'll have learned something of the pattern of nature, of animals, of plants, of trees, birds, fish, and insects. When I am 80, you'll see real progress. At 90, I shall have cut my way deeply into the mystery of life itself. At 100, I shall be a marvelous artist. At 110, everything I create, a dot, a line, will jump to life as never before. To all of you who are going to live as long as I do, I promise to keep my word. I am writing this in my old age. I used to call myself Hokusai, but now I sign myself the old man mad about drawing. I've stayed in touch with him and our friendship has built during that time. In the 1990s, I corresponded a little bit with Ashley, but really felt like I wanted to have a mentor. I work as a physician, I'm a family doc. I've worked in rural areas and emergency departments and the like, and um, also have been an artist uh, my whole life um, and really wanted to try to bring things together um, and in a sense chose Ashley as a mentor um, and started to visit him more and more out on the island. Uh, I also live in Maine. It was uh, wonderful to be in his space, to talk with him, to reflect, to see him working on projects. I became very interested in his puppets and the process over a lifetime of creating those. In 2010, I had a shift in work and his assistant, uh, Suze, who was also a good friend, invited me um, to uh, accompany Ashley on his trips to Africa, uh, initially as medical support, but um, more as a way of, of connecting. I've had the opportunity to travel with him to Africa three times for about a month each time around uh, 2010 through 2014. Ashley has had a connection with Kenya and South Africa for many, many years, in part through literature for children and in part through a group called Copenhagen, which is a women's embroidery collective near Johannesburg, run by a Dominican nun named Sister Sheila, who's wonderful. So we would spend several weeks at each place connecting with the folks that are there, going out into the rural areas, meeting with lots and lots of school kids in their small rural schools. Ashley would bring his joy, his poetry, his desire to connect with everyone at, at every moment. I also had a chance to be with him every day uh, as we traveled and really see this part of him that I hadn't seen prior to that. And that is that alertness and that connection with the moment. Um, Ashley has an astounding collection of poems in his head. 
all types of poetry. So I always begin with a poem by Langston Hughes that I ask everyone to chant with me. My people! My people! By Langston Hughes! The night is beautiful. The night is beautiful. So the faces of my people. So the faces of my people. At any moment that anything, a lot of times mundane things, would come up during the day. From the depths of, of Ashley would come a poem spoken in that way that, that only he does. Beautiful also is the sun. Beautiful also are the souls of my people. Which would really connect the mundane with a much higher spiritual um, and intense experience. Um, I really came to understand the power of poetry and the power of poetry in everyday life. Um, and he continues to do that, to learn poems, always keeping a little poem in his pocket that he's working on memorizing. Around 2010, I also um, felt the urge to document his puppets. They are really a synthesis of many different aspects of his vision, from his real depth of knowledge in art from around the world to his intense fascination with toys of all kinds. I brought up a crew to the island and we were able to photograph and then uh, put together the beginnings of a book that was published as uh, Ashley Bryant's Puppets. He means an enormous amount to me. I've gotten a chance to connect with his family as well, which has been a wonderful experience. It's also been uh, really helpful in my own art as far as um, synthesizing all these different uh, aspects of my life. Um, I thank you for the opportunity to, to share a bit um, about my connection with Ashley. My name is Jason Reynolds. And when I, you know, when I think about, <laughs> when I think about Ashley Bryan, I have so many stories, um, oof, so many stories, but I'll tell you one that I think about the most often. This is maybe mm, six or seven years ago. I think, I think Ashley was like 92 or something like that. And I'm pretty sure we were in Chicago at some sort of conference or festival or something. And we decided that we would have breakfast together. I get down there a little late. I show up. He's uh, he's sort of already scoured the buffet, and you know he's eating. He's not in his nineties, but he was eating as if he was like sixteen. I mean, you know, it was the, it was sort of a it was sort of a strange experience for me, uh, who at the time was thirty one. I want to say, and and I'm looking at this 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 spry young man eat uh, pancakes. I think he had like a mountain of bacon. I remember this specifically, he had so much bacon, uh, like an alarmingly amount, <laughs> an alarming amount of bacon. And he had syrup everywhere and he's like tearing into this food, right? And I'm trying to concentrate on this really intimate moment I'm having with him, but I'm so taken aback by the amount of breakfast that this man is eating. And finally, as he sort of devours his food, I ask him, I said, you know, um, I, I, it, I would be remiss to not take an opportunity to ask you for your advice, especially someone who has exhibited such longevity, not necessarily in your career, but in life, right? Like, yes, you've had a long career, but you've had a long life. And I just want to know, man, I mean, you're, you're in your 90s and, and you're eating this way. And, and I, what's the secret? Like, what's the secret to life? And as he's like, I mean, like n n devouring bacon, right? He says to me, he says, you know what, man? I'll tell you, uh, I don't really have any survival skills, right? I'll never forget it. And you know, so I'm like, wait, what? And you know, you, you come to the elders expecting a certain sort of like, you know, we, we expect them to have a particular kind of pomp when they speak to us, especially as they bestow you know, wisdom from the heavens unto us, right? And so I'm waiting for him to sort of drop some sort of interesting jewel on me. And he begins by saying, you know, 
mind you, there's bacon grease everywhere, right? And he's like, you know, I don't have any survival skills. Um, I don't really know how to do much of anything to keep myself alive every day. I'm not the best cook. I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a driver. I'm not, you know, he's just going through all the things that he's not and how he, how he doesn't necessarily have any of the capabilities, so he said, um, that would warrant him remaining alive and spry. He said, all I know is that every single morning I wake up and make art. And in that moment, uh, there was a profundity that was so thick that it almost strangled me. Um, an epiphanic moment would be minimizing to try to describe what it all was, right? Because really what was happening, and that's all he said, by the way, there was no follow-up. He just went back to his breakfast. Um, but for me, the young, the 30 the, the something year old sitting across from him, you know, I began to get emotional because in that moment I realized that what he understood is what we all are trying to figure out, which is if I could just do the thing I love, if I could just do the thing I'm meant to do every single day, um, then life will be well lived, right? Whether long lived or short lived, doesn't matter. It's all long. If I do the thing I'm supposed to do, if I do the thing I'm meant to do, and if I do the thing I love every day, then it doesn't matter as much that I may not be able to cook or, or do, I, I can cook and do all those things, you know, but, 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 but perhaps, but perhaps he does understand the true meaning, the true meaning of life beyond the minutia and the details that we all get caught up in. And I think forever and ever, I will carry that, uh, that really special, and I don't tell this story, I don't know if I've ever told this story, um, but I, I, I'll carry that, that moment, that nugget, um, that piece of wisdom that has been uh, more of a light than almost any piece of wisdom I've ever been given from an elder uh, with me for the rest of my uh, hopefully very long days. I'm Nikki Giovanni. It's a pleasure to be here to sing a love song for Ashley Bryan. I had the pleasure of working, at, I'm hoping that you can see that, twice with Ashley. My first book with him was The Sun is So Quiet. And I was thrilled when I got a note from Ashley. You can always tell Ashley's notes because they come from his illustrations. And when I saw that, I said, I wonder why Ashley Bryan is writing me. And he invited me to do a book with him. And I was, I was thrilled because I've been knowing Ashley's work and I thought, oh my gosh, I, I don't know that I'm even important enough to, <laughs> to do it. And I, I'm sincere about that. And we did it. I, I sent him the poems and asked him, you know, you pick what you would like. I, I, I wrote the poems, but I said, you, you pick what you, what you would like. And then we did our second book, which he entitled, I Am Loved. And Ashley did the title on this because I, I wasn't sure of the title. I, let, I said, well, you do the title. I, I've done what I'm gonna do. I did the poems. I did go up, of course, when we did The Sun is So Quiet. I went up to the island and uh, I took a train because I love the train and I've been working uh, on trains, uh, on actually on Pullman Porters. And I took a train up and then you, you, know, you go up. You, I took the train to DC, DC to New York, New York to, to Maine. It's one of those. And then you take the, the boat, um, tugboat coming across and he, and he met me. I have one thing that I need to say that probably nobody knows because Ashley has all of the ladies on the island. They, they take care of him. They come and they fix breakfast for him and they you know make sure that he's all right. And so we had dinner and we talked and everything. But the next, the next evening, he said, I'll cook, you know, he talks, you know, darling, like, darling, I think I'll cook for you. And I thought, Ashley, nobody knows that you do your own cooking because he, he's got all those ladies cooking for him. And so I have a photograph someplace of him. He made salmon for me. And we have at his house, what I call my room, which is the back room. And if you've seen his house, you know that his house is just a museum. He, he built a house and then he needed more room. So he built the room in the back. And then he needed more room, so he built a room up. And then he built a room over. And actually my house is just beginning to look like, to look like his. But in what, what I'm calling the back room is what I called my room. And now that he is 
beginning to put his things away to give them to museums and things. One of the stained glass windows in what I called my room, he has given to the museum. And I said, Ashley, how can you give my, my room? <laughs> how can you do that to my room? And he said, oh, darling, I had to give, <laughs> I had to put it away. So he's got the, my stained glass in there. When this project started and CSK invited me to be a part of it, I tried to think, what did I want to say about or to or with Ash? And I realized that I'm just a poet. And so one of the things that was important to me was to start with what's important here. And what's important is that there is day and there is night and there is water and there is desert and there is hunger and there is food and there are good people and there are angels. And Ashley is the angel. And I wanted to say that because every time something good has happened, it's been Ashley and Ashley like people. Ashley is the angel and we have been so fortunate. I have been fortunate to know him and call him friend. And I think earth has been so fortunate to have someone with such a wonderful view of human beings. He makes us all better by his, his view of our participation in art and in life. Hi, I'm Caitlin DeLui. I'm a publisher of Caitlin DeLui Books at Athenaeum Books to Young Readers at Simon & Schuster, which was Ashley's publishing home for so many years. I personally had the glorious experience of being able to work with him as his editor for over 21 years through 12 books. And every, every book was its own journey. Every book I learned more than I ever expected to. Every book was utter joy because I was doing them with Ashley. And I have a few good book stories to share. One is um, in about four years ago, he had been rather ill and he had been just starting to work on Infinite Hope. And he very, very much wanted to get back to the island so that he could get back to his notes and his photographs from the war and keep working on that. And it was the middle of winter, February, middle of winter, Cranberry Island, Maine. And Ashley gets back to his island and says, Caitlin, you must come visit so we can plan out this book. Do I care that it's the middle of winter? Do I care that I have to get across part of an ocean to get to him? I will be there, Ashley. My husband was at the ready. We were checking, we were checking weather charts. We were checking tidal charts because the little mail boat that goes to Cranberry won't run if the, if the waves are too high. People on the island were phoning in, letting me know exactly what information they were getting from the fishermen because the fishermen know the water better than the weathermen do for sure. And we found a close patch where it would, there would be three seemingly clear days that I could get up there to work with Ashley. And I called Ashley and let him know. And he said, you will get up here because even if the weather is not on our side, the fishermen will come and get you and bring you to me. And I loved that. And we got up there, we got up to the island. It was mighty cold and the stories that Ashley was able to tell me by us being together and you know sharing a cup of tea and and cozy with the cold around us that he was able to bring forth that were then interjected into infinite hope never the book never would have been the same if not for that experience um being on the phone together wouldn't have resulted in the wealth that, that came forth in the one-to-one -one conversation and that speaks so much to Ashley that the energy he would receive from others then quadrupled in what he put back to everyone else and into all of his works. Um, so that was working working with him on Infinite Hope is something that's part of part of my being now. Um, and and another island story is there's there's a part of the island and. All the islanders are gonna tell me I'm talking about the wrong direction, but in my head, it's the east, there's a beach. And it's the most remarkable beach because it's all stones, but the stones are perfectly round. It's almost 
preternatural, that, that every stone could be perfectly round. And he brought me to this beach and we're clickety clacketing over the stones. And Ashley's, you know, in his mid eighties at this point, clickety clacketing over the stones, not a care in the world about, you know, stumbling or anything. And he said what he told me, what he loved about these stones was that they were round and the, the beauty in their roundness, they were now perfect balances because everything the ocean had put through them for the for, for, for decades and centuries and millenniums all helped create the objects that were on the beach for the children to find. And I, I, it just epitomizes the way Ashley would look at perfectly round stones on the beach. Um, and I, I think the other remarkable experience um, in, in working with Ashley and wa watching how his, how anything he came across became of value and he turned it into with his mind and his creative instincts, something even greater than it was before because he's brought, he illuminates whatever he's interested in in a way so others can see them differently. And that I think freedom over me is, is the perfect example there when he had been collecting for years and years, the um, auction documents and uh, the, the piece, the pieces, the, the, the billets that would go on, on telephone poles back when um, the enslaved people had no control over their lives here in America at all. And he wanted to do something with them desperately, but he wasn't able to, figure out what initially. Um, and he he had called and said, I, I want to do something with these. And so I'm, I'm going to stop thinking about it. And I'm going to just listen. And I'm going to listen to the 11 slaves who are on the one auction document that he had. I'm going to listen to them. And I think they're going to tell me their story. And a couple months later, he came to me with the first draft of Freedom Over Me. And at that point, the dream pages didn't exist. It was just what each person was doing in the big house or on the plantation, all based on the little bits of information on the document itself. There were no ages. There was, there was very little information except for other bits of things that were heartbreaking. You know, a lantern would be worth $16 and a little boy was worth far less than that. But he, he almost like a detective, took the clues of what was on the plantation and let that fold into who and what the people who helped the plantation exist might be doing. And when he came to me with the first draft, every poem that he had written about each of these people was exquisite, but it was very, as you might imagine, very, very heavy. And Ashley is a man full of hope, always hope. And we talked about that. And I said, if this were for older kids, if this were, you know, nine to 12, nine to 13, this would be fine as is, but you're wanting this for the littles. And I, I wonder how we can inject some hope in there. Um, just just to, to what more could you do with this to give it more of a sense of possibility instead of closing in? How can you bring it outward? And that's all I said. And he thought we were literally at an ALA. We were probably waiting to go into a CSK breakfast because I remember I'm sitting next to him. He's sitting and he's going like this. And then he goes like, you know how when he claps, he does his heels of his, uh, his hands. And he said, they're going to talk to me. I'm, they're going to tell me what they want to do if they aren't, if they weren't slaves and I will have something to you soon. Didn't hear from him. Couple months later, the other half of the entire book. So the dream sections for each person suddenly showed up. And that of course is Ashley. He, he let them talk to, to him and he let himself be open to what a dream of someone who's in the worst circumstances might still have because the only thing that cannot be enslaved is someone's dreams. And that's Ashley. I first encountered Ashley in 1994 when I asked for some works to include in an exhibition of children's book illustration at the Chrysler Museum in Norfolk, Virginia. 
Out of that flourished a wonderful friendship, which really materialized when I became the founding director of the Eric Carle Museum in Amherst, Massachusetts in 2001. Subsequently, I visited Ashley on Islesford in the summer of 2002 and saw his finished work for Beautiful Blackbird. Knowing that the next year at the Carl, Eric and Leo Leone were going to be on view, I thought Ashley's collage work for Beautiful Blackbird would make a perfect addition. This led to a full retrospective in 2005, and Ashley continued to visit the museum to do special programs. Upon my subsequent retirement from the Carl in 2014, I segued to assuming the leadership of the recently founded Ashley Bryan Center with the mandate to help places archive. Through all of this, what continued to dazzle and amaze me was Ashley's extraordinary optimism and his outlook on life. He literally lit up a room. At the retrospective in 2005, when he came into the large, spacious, great hall, the temperature changed. There was a group of librarians and teachers who had made the journey from Birmingham, Alabama, styling themselves the Ashley Bryan Fan Club. And he was in his element. And I think that what is so remarkable about him as a person, Ashley would rather have talked to a kindergartner, a teacher, or a librarian, rather than somebody that might have been able to further his career as an artist. Our colors sport a brand new look. His contribution to the world of children's book literature was groundbreaking, especially through the retelling of African and Caribbean and American folk tales. He, the late John Steptoe and Jerry Pinckney were among the pioneers in bringing children of color into the canon of children's books. This commitment reached its apogee in Freedom Over Me, that incredibly poignant book based on a group of slave documents he had acquired using a sale document that listed just the individual's names and their price, along with the cattle, the sheep, and other chattels. He built these extraordinary stories around them, playing the reality against their aspirations. For Ashley, it was an emotionally draining journey to create that book, but it is a book that will carry an enduring impression. At the center's initial offices in Cambridge, I had been approaching archivists who might be interested in Ashley's extraordinary archive. I contacted the curators at the Hutchins Center for African American Studies at Harvard, and two representatives came up to look at Ashley's World War II materials, the drawings and letters. By coincidence, Ashley was there, and both individuals had stories about relatives' experiences in the war. And I think their powerful reaction triggered Ashley's commitment to create Infinite Hope, that memoir based on the letters to his great friend, Eva Brossel, the drawings that he made on the spot, and the photographs that were culled from a scrapbook I was able to track down through the son of one of his battalion commanders, Martin Hayden. While there are some stock photographs of World War II in the book, the great majority comprise photographs of the 502nd Port Battalion, Ashley's unit. Ashley was committed to creating books that make an enormous difference to, the, to a very important audience. And certainly Infinite Hope is a book that should reach the broadest spectrum of audience because it's a story that tells of the heroism of those soldiers who are on Omaha Beach on D-Day plus three, not to mention the indignities they suffered. It was not an easy time for any of them. And by necessity, for his own sanity and for his family and his friend's sanity, he couldn't reveal what was really going on. He writes to Eva on June 15th, 1944, that's D-Day plus nine, saying, I've been moving around a lot recently, so mail has been a little difficult to come by, but je suis maintenant en France. I'm summering somewhere in France and I have the most palatial residence, which was a foxhole. So that really reflects the upbeat nature of Ashley's personality that stayed with him through the years. And so for me, it has been an extraordinary pleasure and privilege to work with Ashley to place his archive at the Kislak Center at the University of Pennsylvania, where he is going to receive the attention and respect that he is due.
We have come a long way from his initial pro pronouncement. Well, when I die, people can just come and take what they want. Happily, there was a group of family and friends on the island who realized that that was not such a good idea. And with Ashley's eventual consent, they were able to go forward with forming the Ashley Bryan Center. And then he eats her up again. And then he can't eat her just once. That's not enough to punish her. And this is how the story ends. Yay! But that was Ashley. Other people were far more important to him than personal recognition. And so I guess we can say that we're getting back at him by placing his archive in a major research institution. 2022 and 2023 will be the years of Ashley with numerous exhibitions devoted to him in the state of Maine, in New York City at the prestigious Morgan Library and Museum and at the University of Pennsylvania. So there's going to be a terrific celebration of Ashley, which happily he knew all about. So once again, it's been an enormous privilege not only to work professionally with Ashley, but also to consider him a dear friend. My life has been truly enriched. Thank you. I'm Daniel Mentor. I'm an artist, illustrator, and friend of Ashley Bryan. The time that I learned so much about Ashley, I mean, after knowing him for years, was uh, sharing, you know, sharing the, uh, story the stories that he was trying to bring together for his biography uh titled infinite hope uh there were lots of small pieces of stories that he had and in pulling those together into a um into a cohesive book you know it was a uh, it, it was a difficult, difficult process just because Ashley's done so much and there's so, and over and it covered such a long period of time. But what I felt was that it was a or it was it was sort of a, an or should be told in an oral way. Ashley is best when he's telling stories, when he's talking, when he's conversing. So I would sit with them and he would tell me the stories, uh, tell, tell me uh, of when he was in World War II. And we talked conversationally about it. Uh, and I realized that this story was about a young man pursuing his dream of being an artist and not being deterred by anything, not even World War II. Uh, and in a really, you know, in a really, I guess, uh, a kind of a funny way, Ashley would tell, you know, of his, the, how, what an inadequate soldier he made, you know, and how the other soldiers would, you know, uh, make up for his inadequacies so much. But really, uh, he was providing something for them as well. Uh, he was providing a cohesiveness for them, for for the rest of the of the so of the black soldiers in um, in in his group. Uh, he would write letters, tell stories to them. Uh, but all throughout this, Ashley maintained his desire to be an artist and his path. He stayed on his path of becoming an artist. And that's something that I know for I know for a fact that many people who have the uh, who have the desire to be artists, uh, after they go through something like war, uh, especially something like uh, World War II or Vietnam War, a lot of times they, they lose something. They lose something of that, uh, of that drive to create. 
and 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 question and uh, and create uh, beauty in the world. But for some reason, it was the thing that kept Ashley going was knowing that he had that within himself. So that's what our conversations were about. So I felt like uh, he was telling me, you know, the story of his life, uh, the small lessons that he learned along the way. And uh, as he told me, I mean, it would take him back to, you know, from to when he's 18 years old, you know, to when he's 19 years old and the, and the uncertainties of a 19 year old or a young, or a young man at that time, uh, Ashley had all those uncertainties, but there was one certainty that I feel like he could always rely on being there. And that was that creative spirit that drive to be an artist and knowing that that was his purpose in the world was to be an artist. He has been a role model to me in seeing for myself how to be in the world as a creative person, as an artist. Um, and I, I say that not just uh, as a person who makes things, how to make things or how to uh, paint in a technical way or whatever, or how to, um, how to carve or make books or whatever. It's more about how to live, how to embrace the day, how to embrace a, a world that may not understand you uh, or may not acknowledge you, but yet you know that you have value within yourself. Those are the kinds of thing that, uh, things that Ashley uh, reiterates over and over again in so many small ways and so many phrases that he used and so many sayings and, and so much of the attitude that he has is really, you know, showing, demonstrating ways of being in the world. First time I met Ashley Bryan was maybe back in 1974 or five or six. I was, uh, I was a young kid and my parents who were, you know, it's, a, it's an understatement to say they were bookish. My father was a book publisher. My mother was a book editor. They both, they both taught writing and they both studied at Teachers College Columbia University with an emphasis on black children's literature. So the first time I met Ashley Bryan was in a book that my father gave to me, which I still have. It was called, I wanna say it was called Walk Together Children. It may have been a book of woodcut car uh, illustrations that Ashley had done to go along with Negro spirituals. And of course, I fell in love with his artwork. That was the beginning for me of my appreciation for, for, for this man that I would, wouldn't come to, to meet in person for another 30 years or so. So I became um, sort of familiar with him through his work. So fast forward, uh, I just won the Newbery Medal. So I guess it was 2015. And I just spoken at the American Library Association Conference in San Francisco. And so I got a chance to meet Ashley there. But more importantly, he invited me to his island. Right. And I'm thinking, wow, Ashley Bryan's got his own island. Come to find out he lived on an island called Little Cranberry Isle in Maine. He invited me to come and see him. And I was like, cool. So my family and I planned a, a summer road trip. And we started in Washington, D.C. and drove up to Maine. And I remember um, pulling into the harbor and parking the car 
and waiting for the ferry and getting on the ferry and going over to, to, to Little Cranberry Isle. And I remember getting off the ferry and the rain came like a monsoon. It just poured. And we're in the middle of this place. We have no idea where we are. We don't know where Ashley lives. We know he lives on the island, but we don't know how to get there. We don't know which house it is. We don't have an address. We were just told, come to, come to my island. <laughs> and he told us which island it was. So my daughter and my wife and I, we, we get off the ferry and the rain comes fierce and fast. We have no umbrellas and we're drenched. And of course, I'm excited because, yeah, I get to spend some time with Ashley, but I get to eat lobster. Like, that's what I'm looking forward to, right? And so we're not doing a very good job of dodging the rain because it's everywhere and we're drenched. And out of nowhere, this, uh, this golf cart pulls up. Because we're, of course, walking on the island, trying to get to wherever we're going to go. And there's only so many houses on the island, so we figure we'll find it. So a golf cart pulls up, and, and this woman, this sort of like eccentric, ebullient uh, woman uh, who's just wild looking, not wild as in crazy, but wild as in, wow, cool. She's like, are you looking for Ashley Bryan? <laughs> like out of nowhere, like, yes. And so she says, hop in. And so we hop in in the golf cart. And of course, we're now protected a little bit from the rain. And she says, I got to make one stop. And she pulls into the post office. And everybody knows each other on the island. So she's talking to folks in the post office. And then she began to take us on a tour of the island in the rain. <laughs> I'm really gracious, but I'm like, it's raining. And we came to see Ashley. So she takes us on a tour. She shows us, shows us a school or a library where Ashley does regular readings for kids, the kids who live on the island year round. So finally, we get to Ashley's house. And we walk in the house and he greets us at the door. And I think by then it just stopped raining. Of course, like right when we got there, it stopped raining, right? So we get to the door, he greets us, Kwame! Like in his, his, his booming bass, like beautiful welcoming voice, Kwame, welcome. <laughs> and we're just, we feel like we're, are we about to approach, you know, the circus or an amusement park or something? And of course, when we get inside his house, that's exactly what it is. It's a, it's a circus of, of art. It's an amusement park of a visual melody. And my then seven-year-old is completely fascinated by the plethora of toys that are in Ashley's house, hanging from here or on the floor over here or in a shelf here. And uh, Jan Spivey Gilchrist is there, and Deborah Taylor is there, and Jan's husband is there, and two other people there, and it's just it's just this community of of bookish, caring, artful human beings who are just gathered around the table and Ashley's making chicken salad sandwiches for everybody. And we proceed to talk and hang. And I think that's, that was the first of four visits to, to Little Cranberry Isle. And the thing that I remember the most about visiting him is that I felt like I was home. I felt like I was a child again. I felt like I was surrounded by human beings who cared about each other in an authentic, beautiful way. And they did it with such verve. And that's what he was. And that's what he is. He's a, he's a fount of, of, 
of joy and, and, and ebullience and power and humanity. And so it was a coming full circle for me to have you know, read him as a seven, as an eight-year-old, and now to be in his house with my seven-year-old. And I feel like I'm always you know, going to be in the house of Ashley Bryan, wherever he is. I'll be there because his energy, his spirit has, has found its way inside of me in a life-giving and a life-saving way. And that's been the case for so many of us artists and writers. So here's to you, Ashley Bryan. We walk together. We are your children. Thank you. like to use as a subject from which to speak this afternoon, the other America. And I use this subject because there are literally two Americas. One America is beautiful. Jean had become very friendly with Ashley Bryan, who is another super talent in the children's book world. He is an um, amazing artist, amazing writer, professor. He think he speaks six or seven different languages just right off the cuff. And he lives on this wonderful island that he said he went to after, right after the war, World War II. And his house is amazing. The ocean is amazing. When my father died, I said to Calvin, my husband, I, I just want to go to the island and just talk to Ashley. She got the idea of doing the book we do together, but neither one of us would see what we were doing. She wrote the poem, My America. This is actually a poem I wrote based on my son, who was a student ambassador. And I called up my editor and said, I would like for Ashley and I to both illustrate this book. The cool idea she had, Ashley, in addition to being a wonderful writer, is also a super talented artist. And the idea was that both Jan and Ashley would contribute their art for this book. And we decided we would not see what each one was doing. Then he was actually working on this book in Africa, and I was working on it here. We never saw our art because we illustrated the same words, which had never been done before. And it just seemed like such a cool idea to work with artists this way. Here's the title page. Again, Jan's art and uh, Ashley's art side by side. And what we also loved about this idea is, you know, our country is so diverse. And we just thought, you know, you know, okay, maybe it's a little obvious, but why not show the range and the depth of diversity by having two artists who are uh, looking at Americans, looking at the American landscape, the American wildlife, obviously, you know, they're going to have their own interpretations. Laura Bush, uh, the first lady, Laura Bush, selected that book as one of the books for that year. So we were, I was invited with um, Ashley Bryant to come to the White House to a ball. And then the next day, we went to breakfast, first lady and did all these things. Ashley and I read the book on the White House lawn. And it's actually, you can see it on a webcam. It's been there since 2007. I hope you're making a good movie. <laughs> they did one of me called I Know a Man. Not yeah, everybody, they've been showing it around. I, every, I bought the theater out in Chicago. You did? I bought it out and gave everybody tickets. Oh yeah, you wrote me about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah they didn't know you. No, yeah. nobody. Oh, yeah, they did. We know each other. <laughs> <laughs> That's our fame, knowing each other. <laughs> here, over here, say when people ask me how to, fantastic, terrific, great, all day long. Hooray! She so said, don't go into oh, I have a little headache or I have a twinge here or there. Whenever, how are you? Say, fantastic, terrific, great, all day long. Hurrah! And I taught that to a number of friends on the island. And people would hear us where we would care, trying it out.
My name is Sandy Campbell, and I'm Ashley Bryan's nephew through adoption. Actually, his sister Ernestine and her husband Ken were my godparents, and he and I came to know each other when I was about 20 years old. And I didn't realize then when I met him what a lifetime of experience would be for me in being his adopted nephew. Um, we first met at the zoo and we were standing in front of the panther cage and watching the panther go back and forth. And all of a sudden, he started to share with me this quote, this poem by Rilke. And the last line reads, Dann geht ein Bild heinen, geht durch der Kleider, angespannte Stille und hört in ihr Herzen auf zu sein, which means, then an image enters, goes through the tension stillness of the limbs, and in the heart ceases to be. I was amazed. I had no idea that that was the beginning of a journey for the last 55 to 60 years. I had the pleasure of being in his company on numerous occasions and always introduced as his nephew, which I loved and continue to love. Um, I spent time in his home as he built his puppets and sometimes joined in with other groups to make the puppets. And then I was present at many of his developments around books that he did, the main one being Freedom Over Me, which he did uh, about 11 slaves that he found in an auction, the slave papers in an auction. And as he developed each character and what their life would have been had they been freed, um, he would call me and my sisters, Barry and Ray, to take a look at the proofs and say, well, do you like this or not? And of course, we always did. We were fascinated by his work. Some people thought when the book first came out that it was a continuation of some of the block prints that he had done most of his life. However, they were not. They were freehand. Here's an example of one of them one of the characters. He did them freehand. He would call us in and ask us, well, what do you think? What colors should I use? How do you feel about it? And of course, we always had a good reaction. One of my favorite books, and I'm not sure why, I've been asking myself most of my life why, is why uh, is Can't Scare Me, that he did about a young man following through on his wishes to not be afraid of anything. And, and his grandmother would always tell him, but there were giants out there. I'm trying to look at this more deeply to see how somehow something in it has been a part of my life of not being fearful. Finally, one of the books that I had the opportunity to work on with him in planning the planning stages and the proofreading was infinite hope this is the one of the last books that he worked on and is available it's about his experiences during world war ii and the invasion of normandy and how throughout it all he kept hope that things would get better he did his artwork always even though he wasn't supposed to he would keep his art materials in his helmet. He's about to make 99, July 13th of 2022. And we are hoping to celebrate with him at his home in Islesford, Maine. Inshallah. <laughs>
It's a gift, and you're supposed to make most of your gifts. The gift of the morning God gives us, so we make the most of the morning. You have to always explore the gifts you have. People often aren't aware of the many gifts they have. All you have is the moment. The most important thing is right now, and you make the most of it. I say when people ask me how you're fantastic, terrific, great, all day long, hooray! The books will last. They will always be there. I'm sure they're 